Hey, Siemi, Siemi family, Betuabu, uh, Banabetu, Salama to you all. Uh, this is Brother Baya, um, again, coming to you with something else that the Most High has laid on my heart. And I wanted to uh, tackle this subject today um, in this uh, teaching. Um, this year has really been kind of a tough year for uh, my family and some close friends of mine. Um, since this whole COVID-19 thing happened, here in America, we have lost, the last numbers I saw this morning uh, was 565,000 uh, American lives. Um, and <clears throat> some of those lives, I'm sure, um, there are family members who are just devastated um, by the loss of their loved ones. And, you know, whether or not they were up in age, it is still a loss that's been suffered. But this year has been just one that's really touched my family. And so I wanted to kind of get on and talk about um, a subject. Um, and the title of the subject is What Lies Beyond, <clears throat> excuse me, What Lies Beyond. Just recently, um, we lost DMX, uh, young brother, 50 years old. There was another sister I saw, I think uh, she was 47. She was a, an attorney, I think, of Haitian descent. And I've seen her before on CNN and on MSNBC. And um, just recently, Prince Philip, you know, um, passed away. And so this is one th thing that touches us all. And that's the subject of death. And so um, a lot of what I'm gonna talk about um, is going to be something that I um, have been thinking about for quite some time. And there will be some speculation on my part and some theories that um, I hope to show you that based on scriptural references, um, the way I, how I arrived at some of my theories. So we're gonna jump right in uh, to this um, subject um, and uh, we're gonna try to keep it as condensed as I can because it is so much uh, to talk about. And this is a subject that scholars over the years <clears throat> have debated and even till today, we have no clear um, knowledge of what lies beyond because quite frankly, there's not too many people that have gone there <clears throat> and have been able to come back and give an accurate account of what they saw. Now, there are those who have had near-death experiences and they have came back and shared what their uh, visions were or what they saw while they were in that experience. In my 25 year career as a uh, firefighter paramedic uh, for a large metropolitan fire department, death and dying was something that we dealt with on a regular basis. And so um, you may not all agree with some of the points that I will present here, and that's fine. You know, the Bible says that we all see things dimly as looking through a, um, a, a, a tainted or a looking glass that we don't always see things clearly um, when it comes to the spiritual realm but the Bible or the scriptures give us enough uh, breadcrumbs to lead us to certain conclusions that we can either adhere to or we can completely disregard them. So let me go ahead and share my screen and we're gonna get right into it. Okay, let's see. So I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, and here we go. <clears throat> so what lies beyond, and uh, we're gonna talk about 
death and the grave. There are some questions that I would like to answer um, with this teaching. And one of them being, what is life as we know it? What is life as we know it? What is the soul? What happens when we die? And then what is our final fate? What is our final fate? Um, and as we go through, many of these points will be answered throughout. So it's not like point one, point two, point three, point four, but throughout this whole teaching, I'm hoping to touch on those four questions. So I'm gonna start off with the scripture in Colossians 1 um, and 12. It says, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son <clears throat> in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Um, and let's go to, uh, and verse 17 says, and he is before all things and by him all things consist, right? So this is talking about whom the world called Jesus, some call him Yeshua, Messiah, but it's talking about him being the firstborn of every creature and that all things for by him were all things created and for him and by him all things consist. So when we think of what is life, there are things that sustains life, right? And Yesiah, whom the world called Jesus, is one of the, 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 in his divinity, that he is the source that the Father utilized to bring all things into existence, right? We know that the most high in his power, he brought into existence all things, right? All things. Um, I know that one of the things I said in one of my previous teachings that I used to uh, buy into the concept of calling the Most High, He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, until, you know, I really began to think about that. And I'm like, what is the Alpha? Alpha means the first, Omega means the last in the Greek. But the Most High was always in existence. So he was not the first of anything. He was always in existence. He always was, always is, and always will be. And before him, there was nothing. There is no before him. After him, there's nothing. There is no after him. So he existed by himself. That's what makes him the most high. And so in his process of creation, he brought all things into existence by his will. And so, um, you know, we can get deeper into that, but I don't want to get too far um, off track because I'm talking about death and what lies beyond, right? This is a scripture that I've gone back and forth with in several of my lessons because it has significance. And that's in Genesis 1 and 2. It says, and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of Yah moved upon the face of the water. Every time I read that scripture, it seems like that one little phrase was just plugged in there. And it seems like, well, wow, this is kind of out of place. Why was that just plugged in there like that? And the spirit moved upon the face of the water. And the revelation that I got from that is that the spirit is like a catalyst. It's an energy 
conduit that when the spirit moved upon the face of the water, there's in one of the translations it says fluttered or hovered over the face of the water, that it created a catalyzing energy that, 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 that energized the water so that when the Most High said, let there be, things sparked into existence. And so that is the reason why water represents such a significance in the spiritual realm. Why? Because even the very first form of life came out of the water. The very first form of life came out of the waters, right? So we're talking about what is life as we know it, right? Um, Genesis 2 and 7 said, and Yah, Elimo formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostril the breath of life and man became a living soul. Breathed into his nostril the breath of life and man became a living soul. What I like to think of when I read that term breath of life, I like to think of the breath that brings to life, the breath that brings to life, right? You can have breathing and not have life. What do I mean by that? If, and, and, and as I mentioned that I've, I've been a firefighter or was a firefighter for 25 years, and we had a machine that we would hook up to a person who was in arrest that would pump the heart, or we call it, it's a CPR machine, basically. We call it, back in the days, it was called a thumper, but it was basically an artificial life-sustaining machine that, that, that created a, 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 a compression and it also breathed for the patient. When someone is on a ventilator, and some of you have had uh, family members, and especially during this COVID crisis, that have been placed on ventilators to have the ventilators artificially breathing for them. And even a person whose body or who's, who's, who, who no longer has brain function through the electroencephalogram, they, they, they re register brain activity. And many, in some instances, when a body has ceased from brain activity, they can artificially sustain the body through artificial circulation and through artificial respiration. But is there life as we know it in that body? Because see, when the Most High formed man from the dust of the earth, he brought three components together to bring forth life. There was the physical form of the man made from the dust of the earth, and then when he breathed that breath that brings forth life, that spark that, that, that brought forth life, then man became a living soul, a living soul. It didn't say a living spirit. It says a living soul. And in many instances, I hear people use the term spirit and soul interchangeable, but they are actually two different things. And so... <clears throat> I see the, 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 the spirit of the most high, that is his divine, uh, a part of his divine nature that is able to bind the, 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 the physical, the, 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 the body of the man that came from the earth, bind the two together with the, 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 the breath that brings forth life. And when the two of them combine together, it forms what we call a living soul, right? Um, the way how I see it is that there is a, a reservoir of, of, of when the Most High created all that we know, right? He created a reservoir of souls, right? And from that reservoir of soul, when he breathed that breath into man and they became a living soul that he pulled from that reservoir, that first man, Adam, and that bound him together with the, the, the physical body made from the earth and life sp sprung forth. So the way th there's, there's a saying in the um, scientific world that energy cannot be destroyed that once created it can only be transformed to one from one form to another it is never destroyed so i believe that at the onset of creation that the most high he put, brought everything into existence that was going to um facilitate the 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 um not just the the birth of man 
but also generations of mankind to come. And I'm, I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more as I get further into this teaching, right? It said, and fear not them which kill the body. This is Matthew 10, 20. It says, and fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell, right? It didn't, it, it, once again, the soul and the body is, is, is when the, the two things combine, when the, the breath that comes from the most high and the physical body that is of the earth, that it creates a living entity called a, 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 a soul. And um, when you think about it, that everything that comes from the most high is a pure spirit, right? Everything that comes from him is a pure spirit. Um, when a soul enters or a spirit enters a body, this reservoir of souls, if you want to call it that, that enters a human body. See, the first man, Adam, was not born. He was created. But everyone born from that point on had to be merged with a soul, right? This, the, the, the spirit of the Most High, which is the energy, the breath that brings life, and the physical form that starts being created when a man and a woman comes together and forms this, that, 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 that child in the womb, that soul becomes a part of that child. And I believe that when that soul becomes a part of that child, that it is now subject to the influence of the carnal body that it has been placed in. What do I mean by that? Is that all babies, when they are born, are born pure spirits. But because of the corrupting influence of the flesh, then as they are born, even the, how do I put this? The genetic influence of even the parents begin to have an influence on their child um, as it's even growing inside the womb. And so as that child is, is actually birthed into the world, those same corrupting influences can impact the way how that child goes. The Bible said that we are born in sin and shaped in iniquity. In fact, when the first man, Adam, um, um, was created and then Eve afterwards, what did the enemy seek to do in the garden? He wanted to corrupt the seed so that everyone born from that point on was corrupted. So he rushed in to deceive Eve, got her to disobey the Most High, and when she disobeyed the most high, then everything that was produced by her womb, and when Adam disobeyed the most high, everything that came forth from him from his seed became corrupted. And so at that particular point, this is where death entered into the world, sin entered into the world. Ezekiel 18 and 4 says, behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the father, so also the soul of the son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die, right? So once again, it's showing you that it didn't say the spirit that sins. It said the soul that sinneth shall surely die. And if you want to just do a word search in your Bible, if you have an electronic Bible, uh, do a word search for soul. And you will see that everything that mentions souls refer to your emotion, your conscience, your, the, 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 the seed of your, your, your passions, right? These are the things that's referred to as your soul. It is what makes you unique, right? Um, there are life forms. Um, there are lower level life forms and, and higher level life forms, right? I believe that all life forms is sustained by the life-given energy that breath that giveth life that proceeds from the most high, even the simplest of life form has an energy source that, that comes from the most high because he is above all, he is in all, and he is through all, right? So even the lowest form of life is sustained by that energy that comes from the most high, right? But there is a difference when it comes to the higher level life forms, and we're gonna get into that um, also. Right in Job 27 3, it says, All the while my breath, all the while my breath is in me, and the spirit of Yah is in my nostril, 
My lips shall not speak wickedness, nor my tongue utter deceit. So he's showing you a distinction here between his natural breath, when we respiration is another term for while he's res while he has respirations going on, which is his natural breath, but there is also the spirit that is in his nostril. So there's a natural breath and there is a breath that bringeth life, right? And as I mentioned in the example about the ventilator, that you can have someone that's ventilated, but who is who has whose whose life has left him because that spirit that bringeth life has departed from him. Um, Genesis 7, 21 said, and all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beasts and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life of all that was in the land, in the dry land died. So once again, the breath that bringeth life we're not just talking about respiration. We're talking about the spirit that bringeth life, right? Let's keep it going, right? And the, uh, the flesh and the spirit, right? Ecclesiastes 3, verse 19 says, For that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth beasts. Every one thing befalleth them. Even one thing, sorry, befalleth them. As the one dieth, so dieth the other. Yea, they all have one breath. And when you look in, at, at that term, it's Strong's H7307, which is Ruach. So that a man have no preeminence above a beast for all his vanity. So what does it mean by they all have one breath, right? Um, is it just the physical respiration or is it the, the, the energy that came from the most high that produces the life in all beings. Think about this, right? That what differentiates us from the animals is that the animals were created by just the word of the most high, but he breathed the breath into man, right? And man became a living soul. That is why there is a spirit in animals. And if you, if, if, if you ever looked into the eyes of an animal, you can see that there is a spirit behind that, right? There is a spirit of a man, and then there's a spirit of a beast. Ecclesiastes um, 3.21 says, who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth, right? Um, what it's saying is that there are certain earthbound spirits and certain spirits that are heaven bound. The reason why there's a differentiation is because the spirit that brought man to life was different when he became, when he merged with that flesh and became a living soul because the most high imparted that spirit unto him by breathing into him. That's why we are created in his image and in his likeness. It is only the most high that can give life. We often say he is the giver of life. It is only his spirit, his energy that can produce life, right? And so the life that is in an animal, that spirit that is in the animal is bound to the earth. But the spirit that is in a man is bound to the father himself because it, even though all of them proceeded from the father, but the, the, the spirit that is in a man returns to him because it proceeded from the father when he blew that breath into man. And from that point forward, everything that creates that living soul in a man was from that spirit, that spark that brought forth life and created that entity we call the soul. Um, Ecclesiastes 12 and verse seven says, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return to Yah who gave it, right? Um, so when it comes on to our bodies, when we die, when we pass on, that that which is of the earth is going to return to the ground. But the spirit that gives life, that gave us, that animated us, returns back to the father who gave it. 
um, Psalms 146 and verse three says, put not your trust in princes, nor in the son of man in whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth in that very day his thoughts perish. So when a man's breath leaves him, then he no longer, uh, uh, the thoughts, the interaction, the emotions, all the things that he experienced while in this body stops at that particular point because he enters into a different realm of reality. He enters into a different realm of reality. Blood cries out. And Yah said unto Cain, where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Right? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Um, was it just the blood or was it the, 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 the physical body that was, that was destroyed by what Cain did that spilled his blood that that part of him, remember I said that, that the Most High created uh, three things that fused together to form a living soul. He had the physical body, which he created out of the dust of the ground. Then he had the breath that he breathed the, or the breath that brings forth life. And then that spark that created that, that merged the two entity together to create a living soul. So when you kill someone and you spill their blood, that, that soul that is connected with that physical body, that blood is able to even cry out to the most high, right? Um, Leviticus 17, 11 says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. That's why the Bible talks about spilling innocent blood. And there is a judgment for those who spill innocent blood. That's the reason why those who are involved in Satanism and, and witchcraft and all of these things, they try to get children or babies, infants, because they are seen as innocent. They have not yet been corrupted as how adults have been corrupted. There's a scripture that says that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. So when it comes to, it is only blood that can redeem from sin. That is the reason why it was necessary for the sacrifices of bulls and goats and all of those things. But those things couldn't sustain it. So it took the sacrifice of, of Yesiah, the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world in order to provide a mechanism by which we can all receive redemption from sin through the sacrifice of his blood. Blood cries out. <clears throat> um, verse Leviticus 17, 12 says, therefore I said unto the children of Israel, no soul of you shall eat blood, neither any shall any stranger that sojourneth among you eat blood. Once again, because the life of the flesh is in the blood. So as his people, we were commanded to never eat anything with blood in it. <clears throat> and there was a way of getting rid of the blood, even when we were to kill an animal. But that's that's going off into a different topic. So <clears throat> Revelation 6, 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the words of Yah and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, how long, O Yah, holy and true, Dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Here are the souls of them who were slain for uh, the word of Yah and for the testimony which they held. And so they were crying out from under the altar. So the question then becomes, was it only those that had was able to cry out, the ones who were slain? Or the ones, um, or are there others who are able 
to communicate the same way because I've heard different teachings and I've heard different people's opinions about whether or not when we leave this body that there is a consciousness. Some say that we, once we leave this body, we go into a place of sleep, of rest, where there is no conscious thought and that we just are waiting until the, the second coming of Isaiah when <clears throat> that's the time when we'll all, <clears throat> excuse me, awaken and come back in some form of existence. Well, that is not my belief and that is not the conclusion that I come to when I read the word. And there again, as I go through these different scriptures, I'm hoping to show you that we have to come out, and I've said this in, in some of my previous teachings, is that we have to stop trying to uh, 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 use our intellect to try to figure out everything. Because in the spiritual realm, to the, to the, to the natural man, there's certain things that just doesn't make sense. And so we have to stop trying to figure the most high out using our natural mind and our natural intellect because he is so far above us. And the things in the spiritual realm, the rules are all different there. And so um, do we all have clarity? As I said in the beginning, we're all trying to figure a lot of things out. And the things that I'm, I, that I'm presenting here is based on my understanding of the scripture. There again, you can agree or disagree, and that's fine. You know, we're just here to learn together. And, and, and I would encourage that if someone has another opinion, I'd love to hear it because I'm here to learn just like you are, just like you all. You know, we're all trying to learn. Um, the fate of the righteous and the wicked. Luke 16, verse 22. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell... He lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried on, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tortured in this flame. Uh, this is a story that we've uh, all in Christianity we've heard several messages preached on that. But the gist of this story is that you had two different people that passed away, died as we know it. One who in his life lived sumptuously, had all the finer things that life could offer. The other one was a beggar, just desiring to eat the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. But now the rich man is in hell being tormented. And the, the beggar that died, the Bible said, was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom or the place called Abraham's bosom. Why was it Abraham's bosom? Why not Moses? Why not Noah? There's a reason for that, but I don't want to get off into that side note um, in this particular teaching. But it was a place of comfort for Lazarus while the rich man was in torment. And we know the rest of the story that he was saying, you know, could you send Lazarus back to one of my brothers because I've got brethren, they don't want to come to this place. And he's like, no, they got the prophets because I'll let them hear them because even if one was to come back from the dead, people wouldn't believe, right? And so um, there are different places where souls, when it leaves this body, goes. And I know that if, 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 if you're one that believes that, well, the soul just goes into a place of eternal or, or sleep or, 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 or rest until the time when Isaiah comes, well, this, is, this doesn't make, fit that narrative, right? Because you're seeing that both of them after dying, there was a consciousness to both of them. But not only that, but there was pain and suffering, torments, and there was comfort in the bosom of Abraham. Okay, um, Psalms 34 and 7 says, The angel of Yah encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. Why did I put that particular uh, scripture there? Um, personal uh, uh, experience. Uh, my wife has shared this story. Uh, when her mom uh, was uh, about to pass away, my sister-in-law um, had a dream or a vision 
that she saw in the room where my, my mother-in-law was, a Maleki or an angel was waiting to escort her soul back to the most high, to that place of comfort. And when my wife um, knew that, she knew that her mother was going to pass away because there was a Maleki waiting to escort her home. Um, we may or may not believe in these things. You know, we have that, that term, the guardian angel. I believe that for every soul that the most high in his preeminence decides on, he is going to allow that, that soul to enter into the realm of existence, that there is a Maleki, an angel that facilitates that particular soul uh, uh, being placed into what's, what's to, what is to become the body that's going to, that's going to be the, the, the vessel, the vehicle to, to, to carry that soul, right? Um, Matthew 18, 10 says, take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven, their angels do always behold the face of my father, which is in heaven, right? Does it mean that when a person now is, is, is entered into this realm and if they are not of, of righteous, that, that, that angel is no longer there to, 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 to minister to them? That part, I don't know. I don't know about when it comes to the wicked and what happens to that angel. I just know that when it comes to the righteous, that the Most High has a Maleki, that it's on assignment for you specifically. And um, that assignment is a permanent assignment to you. The angel of the Lord encampeth. That means he stays there. He surrounds you. He's there with you. He is, a, he is, he is, he is there with you all the time. All right? Um, Second Corinthians um, 5 verse 1 says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle was were dissolved, we have a building of Yah, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. When reading that scripture, there are two, there are three different things that are mentioned there. There is your earthly house, which is this body that possesses our soul, right? That is animated by the spirit of the most high Yah. Then there is a tabernacle, right? Which when we think of a tabernacle in, in today's, we even name churches tabernacles. It is more suited for a an assembly of people, which is, is greater than a house, but less than a building. Because within a building, now you can have several, uh, 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 I don't know if I want to call it tabernacles, but a building is designed to house many more. It's just like the, the World Trade Tower to have all these different businesses in there before they came down. So that's the kind of way how I, I, I see that when we leave this earthly house, that we are a part of a collective and we return back to that collective awaiting when it's, when it's a righteous soul, it's awaiting that final day, but they are in rest and comfort. When it's an unrighteous soul, that's on, that soul goes to a place of torment awaiting final judgment. Um, Second Corinthians five and eight says, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with Yah, right? So this implies that when we are absent from the body, we are present with the Most High in the moment, in a twinkling of an eye. Um, I, I, I don't watch the whole uh, Derek Chauvin trial for those of you who are um, keeping track of what's going on with the death of George Floyd. But there was a testimony of a, a doctor, an older gentleman, and um, when he said that, as he was describing it, he said, you can see at, at, a, at a point that there was life in George Floyd, and then the next second there was not. Um, one of my reasons for doing this teaching is that when we leave this realm of existence, the moment we take our last, last breath, then 
what happens on the other side. And this is just things that we are we need to think about because we only have this one life to get it right. Because when we close our eyes on this side of eternity and we open our eyes on the other side, then everything that we, whether we believe in, the, in God or not, whether we believe in all of these things, the spiritual realm, heaven, hell, whether we believe any of that is irrelevant because once you are on that side, doesn't matter what you believe when you are on this side, that reality now becomes your new reality. Anyway, let's keep it moving. Um, Philippians uh, 121 says, for me to live is Yeshua or Yesiah or Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I what not, or what I shall choose, I, 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 I don't know. For I, in, in other words, he's kind of like in a dilemma. He said, for I am betwixt, for I am in a strait betwixt two, right? I'm caught up between these two uh, 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 trends of thoughts. Having a desire to depart and to be with Yesiah or Christ, Yeshua, which is far better, nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. So once again, here is an indication that to depart from this body when you are a righteous person, that you immediately go on to be with Christ, right? And when I say with him, is in that place of comfort to be a, to, you go back to being a part of that, that pool of soul, that reservoir of souls that is awaiting the final day of judgment. Transfiguration, Matthew 17, verse one. And after six days, Yesiah or Jesus, Yeshua taketh Peter, James and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart and was transfigured before them and his face did shine as the sun and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Now this story, once again, is another one of those that we've heard all of our lives in Christianity. And when you think about it, this represents two states of uh, or two, two, two different people, right? That Moses we know died, right? So Moses physically died. And Elijah, Elijah or Elias was translated. He was transformed. He never tasted death. But now the two of them appear to Yesiah. Both were speaking with him, and the disciples saw them, right? So were these people the only ones that had a consciousness after they had either made a transition from, 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 from this life into the eternal and didn't taste death like Elijah did? Or like Moses, who did die, but yet they're both standing here talking to Isaiah or Jesus or Yeshua, right? Um, Mark uh, 12, 24 says, and Isaiah answering them, Yeshua answered unto, said unto them, do you not therefore err? Because you know not the scriptures, neither the power of Yah. For when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. And as touching the dead, that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses, how in the bush Yah spake unto him, saying, I am the Elimo of Abana, of Yitzaka, of Yakuba, right? He said he is the Elimo of, he is not the Elimo of the dead, but the Elimo of the living, you therefore do err. Once again, this is a statement that when the Most High was saying to Moses, Masa, I am the Elimo of your forefathers, 
Abana, Abraham, Yitzhak, Isaac, and Yakuba, Jacob, right? He said he's not the God of the dead. He is the Elimo of the living. So when we die, do we go into a state of, 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 of nothingness, just awaiting? Or are we still alive? Our soul, that which makes us uh, unique, is that still alive in, in this reservoir, as I call it, uh, this collective. Um, I used to, um, I'm a big science fiction fan, and I, I, I've said that before. In the movie Star Trek, or in the, in the series Star Trek, there was a guy, I cannot remember his name, but he was uh, this, this being that was shapeshifters. And because he didn't know how to um, uh, properly emulate the, 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 the way a, a human being looked, he kind of created his own and uh, shape and he kind of looked funny the way how he, how he was. But there was once one of the episodes that he actually ended up back on his home planet. And in his home, on his home planet, there was this pool of water that uh, the crew didn't know what it was. And somehow, and I forget how the whole movie went, but he found himself back in that pool where they were actually his people. And so he became a part of that collective and he didn't want to leave, but they somehow pulled him back out of it. And, you know, as the story went, but, but, and, and I was thinking about this lesson, I remember that episode and I'm, I, I see us as being like that when it comes onto the spiritual realm, that there's a pool that we return to when we, that, that we came from that, 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 that pool and we return back to that pool of souls that, that, that awaiting the time of our, of, of, of the final judgment. But, the, but, but there's a distinction before we are born and after we've lived the life in this flesh because what happens to us depends on how we live this life. Once we emerge with a body and become a living soul, then the influences and the things that we've done in this body determines the place that we return to when we return back to the Father. Anyway, um, in, in um, Jeremiah 1 verse 5 says, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Um, before you came out of the belly, I knew you. And before you came out of the womb, I sanctified you and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Um, I don't want to get too far off into this, but I personally believe that life, we, there's, a, there's always been a question. When does life begin? Does it begin at conception? Does it believe, be, begin when there's a, a heartbeat detected? Or uh, does it begin when the child takes the first breath? And those who are for uh, uh, abortion rights and those who are against uh, abortion <clears throat> will argue different things. And my personal belief is that life begins before conception. Life begins before conception. And the scriptures that I'm presenting here is showing you that there is a consciousness because what did he mean by I knew you? Before you were in, before I formed you in the belly, so that before before your, your your members started taking shape inside the womb of the woman, I knew you, and it goes back to what I'm saying about I believe that on the day of creation, that the Most High created everything because when He rested on the seventh day, He knew that He had come He had done a complete work, which means that. And we're going to talk this this word predestination. We're going to we're going to talk more about it. But I believe that He created everything that was to come into existence, um, every soul that was to come into existence, the malakis, the angels that were His ministering spirits that they were all created before the foundation of the earth. Anyway, um, <clears throat> Psalms one thirty nine verse sixteen, Thine eyes that see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book, all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned 
when as yet there was none of them. So that my members were written in a book, right? When was that book created? Before the foundation of the earth. And so all of our members, what does it mean our members? This is another uh, subject that um, our DNA determines our members, right? Um, that our parts, whether we're gonna have uh, straight hair, kinky hair, uh, uh, darker melanin, lighter melanin, you know, all of our members, our hands, our feet, our heart, all of those things, because there's specific genes, there's specific DNA strands that will cause as the body is developing to develop a hand, to develop a, a foot, to develop a heart. You know, there's specific DNA strands coded within the DNA strands are those members. So all of our members, you could put it in another way, are coded. Our DNA is coded in a book so that when even though we were not, the, 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 the physical body was not yet perfect, but because our members were already there, the code that made us who we are and made our parts who they are, whether I was going to be short or, 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 or tall, it, it, it was all coded in a book that was before the foundation of the earth. Isaiah 49, 1 says, listen, O isles unto me, and hearken ye people from far. Yah has called me from the womb, from the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. You had a name before you were even in the womb of your mother. There's a scripture and, and you notice that um, a lot of times the Most High would refer um, when talking to Abraham that your seed will be as the stars of the heavens or as the sand of the seashore. Um, the stars sometimes refer to the luminary bodies, but the stars can also refer to heavenly bodies. And that example in, I believe in the revelation when it talks about the serpent and he drew a third of the stars of heaven um, with his tail. It wasn't talking about the luminary bodies. It was talking about heavenly beings. But here again, I don't wanna get off on a sidetrack. Um, uh, Romans eight verse 29 says, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, whom he did foreknow, he did predestine. The word, look, let's look up, foreknow is Strong's G4267, uh, prognosco, uh, I'm not even, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but it says to have knowledge beforehand of those whom Yah elected to salvation. And then the word predestinated is Strong's G4309, proizo, to predetermine the side beforehand in the New Testament of Yah decreeing from eternity, predestination. Some people don't believe in it and that's fine, it's your choice, but I believe that the Most High, when he created the heavens and the earth, that there were certain things that was set in motion that was predetermined from the foundation of the earth. And there are certain people that was predestined. And I know that um, there are some religious cultures that build their whole theology on this this idea of predestination. Well, if I'm predestination for destruction or I'm predestined for life, I can do whatever I want to. See, this is once again trying to apply human logic to spiritual matters, right? Because I believe that if you think that you are predestined for salvation and you go out there and you sin and do whatever you want to, you might have been one of those that was predestined for damnation. Or if you are somebody who was out there cutting up and you changed your way of, of, of living and you, 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 you became righteous and began doing the right thing and obeying the laws of, and the commandments of the Most High, and now you are saved, then you might have been one of those ones that was predestined for salvation. You see, it, it, it's, it's, we cannot apply human logic to the Most High, right? Um, Romans 8.30 um, said, for whom he did, predest he did predestinate, 
them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified, right? So there are some that was called from the foundation of the earth. What did he say about Isaiah? That he was slain from the foundation of the earth. So why would he be slain from the foundation of the earth? Because the Most High knew that along the path of destiny, along the path of the human timeline, that there was going to come a time when he was going to have to be shed his blood so that we, through his blood, can receive redemption. So all of that was put in place even before the foundation of the earth. Once again, we have to come out of our human logic and let the scriptures or let the spirit of the Most High speak to us. Um. Ephesians 1, verse 3 says, Blessed be Yah, the, 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 the Abba of our Lord Isaiah, whom hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Isaiah, in Yeshua, right? According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame and before him in love. That's the reason why the Bible said that he knows them that are his. He knows them that are his because they were predestined from the foundation of the earth to be his. Ephesians um, um, uh, 1 verse 5. Um, I think I just read that. Verse six. No, I, I, I think I missed five. It says, having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Isaiah, Yeshua, to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Um, Romans 9.22 says, what if Yah, willing to show his wrath, and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted for destruction. The vessels of, of, of wrath fitted for destruction. Who is he talking about there? What he is saying there is that there are certain vessels of wrath that was fitted. When you look up the word fitted, it means suitable destined for, created for. And I know that may sound harsh to some people because we often use scriptures like, well, God loves everybody. Well, he loves all of his creation, but it doesn't mean that all of his creation loves him. He says, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. So what does that mean? Anyway, um, there are certain vessels that are of wrath that are fitted for destruction. John 17, 12 says, while I was with them in the world, this is Isaiah or Yeshua talking, he said, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. Who was the son of perdition that he's talking about? He was talking about Judas that he was called the son of perdition. When you look up those terms, the son of perdition, it once again says that they were destined to do the things that he, that he was destined to do the things that he did so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Predestination. Um, second uh, Thessalonians 2 verse 3 says, let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. The son of perdition. I believe that, there, that this, here is referring to the Antichrist, and you can read, um, read uh, the rest of that chapter. But the spirit of the Antichrist was already in the earth. And from he was that same spirit that was in Judas. That same spirit that was in this man that's going to be revealed. Spirits don't die. They are eternal. 
And so the most high is going to judge those spirits at the day of, of at the final judgment. But once again, there are those who are operating as in perdition, like Judas, like the Antichrist, and there are others who are destined for destruction. We can believe it or we, or, or we don't have to, but I'm just trying to present what the scriptures say about these things, and then it's up to us to decide. The nature of the flesh versus the spirit. Romans 8 verse 11 says, but if the spirit of him that raised up Isaiah, Yeshua from the dead, dwell in you, he that raised up Isaiah from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by the spirit that dwells in you. So what this is showing you is that it was the spirit that gave the power for Yesiah to resurrect from the dead. It was by the spirit, right? First Corinthians 15, 39 says, all flesh is not the same, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fish, another of birds, there are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another, right? Remember I mentioned earlier that there are certain earthborn spirits and then there are certain heavenborn spirits. That's, like, that's why when the animals die, the spirit that brought them life, they are earthborn spirits versus those that are heavenborn. And they're... <laughs> One of the things that we don't fully understand and is not taught is what are the roles of spiritual beings, spirits as we call them, in, in the overall act of creation, in the overall uh, 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 um, manner of the way we live, in the overall operations of the earth, and the overall operations of things. That is a deep, deep subject that, you know, um, in these last days, we need to dive into these things because what is going on in the earth is dependent upon what is happening in the spiritual realm and if we are ignorant of these things we're going to be fighting on the wrong battlefront but anyway that's just a side note um in first corinthians um 15 verse 44 it says it is sown a natural body it is raised a spiritual body there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Um, as it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last man, Adam, was made a quickening spirit. See, when Adam, he, he became, how do I put this? Um, when he sinned, disobeyed the commandments, right? He was a living soul that sinned and brought death into the world. What did the Most High tell him? In the day that thou sinneth, thou shalt surely die. That means that, that, that sin that brought forth death had to be reversed by a, another Adam that would bring forth life, a quickening spirit, which means bringing to life. So by Adam, all that was born after him was subject to death. And all that came after Yesiah's death was now being able to be quickened, both in the natural sense, because we were made a new creation. When we accept him, his spirit enters into us and it begins to change our whole uh, uh, um, the, the, the way how we live our lives in this flesh. Right? There's a scripture that says that the, 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 uh, I am crucified with Christ, but nevertheless I live, but yet not I, but, but Christ that liveth in me and the life that I live, I live by faith in the son of, 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 of God who loved me and gave himself for me, if I'm quoting that right. right? So he became a quickening spirit, and it is by, his, by the spirit that when the time comes that we will be changed into a resurrected body similar to Isaiah, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, 1 Peter 3, verse 19 says, but which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient, which once the long suffering of Yah waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is eight souls, were saved 
by water. So this was a reference to the Yesiah going and preaching to those who had died prior to the flood. And, you know, one of the things that I'm not, and, and I'm just going to be honest with you, I'm not sure that if it was only those up until the flood, or if it even included those up to Yesiah's uh, uh, came, came into the earth. Because there again, Yesiah was the firstborn of many brethren. So that means that no one could take on or enter. Here's what I believe, um, that in order to be to enter into that place of rest, awaiting for the reunification of the soul, as we consider it, with a body, right, that will face the final judgment, I believe you have to be escorted into the kingdom, into that place of rest, right? Um, and so um, I believe that those who were stuck in, in, in prison, as, as the scripture referred to it, had to wait until Yesiah came and release them from that prison so that he could escort them into that place of rest that is awaiting them until that final day of judgment. Um, um, okay, First Peter uh, 4 verse 5 says, who shall, who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to Yah in the spirit. So was he preaching the gospel to people who was in a state of cat catatonic state, no, no, um, no uh, life, no thought, no consciousness. I guess consciousness is the best word that had no consciousness. So how could you preach to someone that has no consciousness? And I know we can say, well, he's Yesiah. He could have wakened them up. And, and there again, we can believe whatever we want to. I am just trying to show that when we leave this body, that it doesn't mean that we go into a place of lack where there's no consciousness that we continue to maintain a consciousness about us uh, to where we can either go to a place of torment or go to a place of, of rest, um, inheriting the kingdom. Now I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of Yah, neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump for the trump shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed, All right? For this corruptible must put on incorruption and mortality must put on immortality. So uh, once again, it's talking about the nature of the flesh. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom because flesh is, is mortal. Flesh uh, is, is corrupted. And so flesh cannot go into the spiritual realm. Even in the realm of judgment, the kind of flesh that's going to be an eternal damnation is not the flesh that went back to the ground. It is a flesh that can that that it becomes eternal. Um, First Corinthians um, fifty four. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written: Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. So, um, once again, if you if you uh, if if you notice, um, and I think it's in the next slide, so I I, I don't want to jump ahead. <clears throat> Resurrection, Luke twenty four uh, verse thirty six says, and as they thus spake, Yeshua Yeshua himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Be, uh, behold. Uh, uh, verse 39 says, behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself, handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. This was when after Yesiah's resurrection and he appeared in the room with them, they all thought he was a ghost. And it freaked them out. And he says, no, I'm not a ghost. I'm not a spirit. He says, come, handle me, touch me, feel me. 
do a uh, spirit does not have a a a a, a, a corporeal form or, or or a physical form he says a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you have seen me as you see me so there is a flesh and there is bones but it is different from the flesh and i remember i read earlier that there is a one uh, one flesh of animals one flesh of, of of you know there is a different flesh and bone to the spiritual realm and what are some of the things that he was able to do in his divinity he, he was able to be touched they even said that they gave him a meal he was able to eat and so you know that's a, i think that's a subject for another time when we to talk about well what is the state of the spiritual beings and what we will be able to do in the spiritual realm once we are in our resurrected bodies anyway um uh first thessalonians 4 60 says for, for yah himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel um I think I read that already, um, because this is talking about this is this is where we get the rapture doctrine from, and that's a whole nother subject. So I won't even get deeply into that. But um, let me just go down to Second Ezra, um, verse seven thirty-two. Second Ezra seven, uh, chapter seven, verse thirty-two says, "And the earth shall restore those that are asleep in her, and so shall the dust that uh, the dust those that dwell in silence." And the secret places shall deliver those souls that were committed unto them. Um, this is a book that um, is a part of the Apocrypha. And I know that some people don't read the Apocrypha, and that's fine. But um, this is um, uh, in the book of Ezra, second Ezra, where it says that the earth are going to restore those that are asleep. See, in, in all the scriptures that I've shared, what is showing you that what part then goes to sleep. I believe that it is the physical body that returns to the ground, returns to the dust, that that is the part of our existence that goes to sleep. It is that part that returns to the dust, returns to the earth, right? That part of our bodies goes to sleep. But the other part of our bodies, the, what constitute the soul is still a consciousness that is that is that is alive and experiencing things right um isaiah uh 66 verse 22 says for as the new heavens and the new earth which i will make shall remain before me saith yah so shall your seed and your name remain and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one sabbath to another um shall all flesh come to worship before me saith yah and they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me for their worms shall not die neither shall their fire be quenched and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh um this is referring to and i believe that at the time when we are now um living in the new heaven and the new earth that we're going to be able to see the souls of those who have transgressed and the torment that they are in and 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 it says from one new moon to another that the bible says that the worms never die and the fire be not quenched this is the fate that is awaiting those who are transgressors and i'm hoping that our that, that when people hear things like this that they will take it to heart uh conclusion um, 2 Timothy 1 verse 7 says, For Yah hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Um, the reason why I am bringing this scripture here is the fear of dying um, is a natural thing amongst all of us. No one wants to die. Um, in fact, we don't even like to think about dying. You know, um, when I was working, um, uh, there were times when, you know, guys who, when they get got tired, they had no qualms about jumping on the gurney, what we call the gurney or the stretcher, and laying down and sleeping, going to sleep. I couldn't do it because I know how many dead people that we had on those gurneys, no matter how many, how much times you change the sheet and disinfect or whatever. But I just, it's something about that gurney that I could not do it. I would rather go to sleep on the bench seat, which is the, the seat that we, the officer would sit 
and the paramedics who are, uh, are attending the one on the gurney. I would rather lay down on that and go to sleep if I had to uh, go to sleep. And there are times we had long assignments that we were out there for hours and hours. You know, we were on watches or whatever. And so we had to stay out there for hours and hours. And if I was going to lay down and sleep, that's where I would sleep, but not on that gurney. Too many dead bodies was on that thing. Um, but the fear of death will cause us to do things that we would not naturally want to do because they, 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 they're, they're such a thing called fight or flight that the body tries to preserve its life in the natural sense. And if, if the fear of death can cause us to agree to things that we would not normally want to do, but because we don't want to die, we do those things, then death has power over us because people can use the threat of death in order to get us to comply. And for those who are um, who understand biblical prophecy, that there is going to come a time when you may be faced with having to die or live if, you, if you're going to be in compliance. Um, 1 Corinthians 15, 19 says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Now, if Isaiah is risen from the dead and became the first fruit of them that, but now is Isaiah risen from the dead and become the first fruit of them that sleep. So this is just assuring us that yes, I know this is all we know. We have friends, we have families, we've developed a life, we've developed relationships. And so we want to hold on to this for dear life. And, and, and anything that threatened this, we will fight our hardest to try to maintain. But there's also a scripture that says that him that saveth his life shall lose it, but he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it again. I'm not saying that we're going to go out and do stupid things to jeopardize our lives. And we want to try to take care of ourselves and try to, you know, eat healthy and live healthy and do the right things to prolong our lives as long as we can. But we cannot be so fearful of death that we're willing to just go along with the programs. And those of you who have ears to hear will understand what I'm saying, just because we are afraid of dying. Um, Hebrews 11 says, uh, 35 says, women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Um, this story, and I'm going to read in another apocryphal book, um, in the book of Maccabees, um, a story that I think that everyone should read. Um, and whether you believe in the apocryphal books or, you, or not, but this story here is a powerful testimony of, 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 of um, people. I know we read in the Bible about people such as the three Hebrew boys that in the face of being thrown in the fiery furnace, that they stood in the face of the king and said, we're not going to bow no matter what. You kill us, throw us in the air if you want to, we're not going to bow. Um, Daniel in the lion's den, we know about that. But this story in the book of Maccabees, I thought was a powerful story, right? Second Maccabees 720 says, but the mother was marvelous above all and worthy of honorable memory. For when she saw her seven sons slain within the space of one day, she bare it with a good courage because of the hope that she had in Yah. But doubtless, verse 23 says, but doubtless the creator of the world who formed the generation of man and found out the beginning of all things will also of his own mercy give you breath and life again as you now regard not your own selves for his law's sake. Um, just real quickly, the backstory of that was um, when the Greeks came in and, and took over um, the Holy Land and they were, you know, trying to get the Israelites to, uh, to, to break the commandments of the Most High, there were these seven brothers that was brought before the king. And he told the, 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 the first one, said, you're going to eat the swine's meat. And he's like, no, nah, I ain't eating that. He's like, if you don't eat the swine's flesh, we're going to cut off. We're going to, we're going to chop off. I mean, we're going to, we, we, we're going to torture you. We're going to, you know, and he, you know, the, the, the thing that he said, you know, I mean, the, the, the courage that he stood, they, you know, the King ordered his tongue to be cut out and for, you know, for each of his limbs to be cut off. He, he ordered them to boil up a cauldron, a pan and to throw his, I mean, you all need to read that story. 
If you all haven't read it, y'all need to read that story. It is a powerful, powerful story. And one by one, they brought each brother before uh, 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 the, the king and he would tell them, you better do this or you better eat this swine's flesh. You better, and they're like, nah, we ain't doing, we're not breaking the commandments of our forefathers. We're not breaking the commandments of the most high. Another one died, another one died, another one died, being tortured all the way up until the last son, the youngest. And the, the, the king tried to promise him, listen, if you do this, I'm gonna give you all kind of riches and fame and you'll be my friend and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, nah, you can take all that stuff because I'm not doing it. He went to the mother and said, listen, mama, you better talk to your son. Y'all done seen what I did to all the other children. This is the fate that's awaiting him. And when you hear what the mother told him, you know, it was it's just a beautiful story. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna stop sharing here because um, I'm wrapping this up. I, 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 I just have one other thing I wanted to quickly share with you all. Um, this is a, a passage in um, what's called the Pseudepigrapha, right? Um, many of you may not have ever heard of it and may not even be fully um, knowledgeable of what it even is, but it is um, another extra canonical book as we say. But I'm going to just read it real quickly, um, a couple of passages from it. And um, it just kind of goes in line with what I have been uh, saying in this teaching. And so you can receive it or you can't. But um, let me go ahead and read this real quick and wrap this up. Um, here we go. Share this. Okay. Um, I took a copy of this and I, I should have written um, where exactly in the suit of figure for it came from. Um, what I might do is just, uh, for those of you who have the, the, the pseudepigrapha and want to know exactly where this passage is, I might try to add it in the description or uh, when, when the video posts. I, I, sh I should have um, uh, actually say where the text is taken from. But let me read this. Um, this is the state of the departed before judgment. Um, it said, and I answered and said, if I have found favor in thy side, this is, this is um, Ezra, Ezra, I believe. And um, he was talking to a, a, a Malachian angel. Um, and, he, and the angel was, was revealing certain things to him. And he said, if I found favor in your sight, Lord, my Lord, show this also to your servant, whether after death, as soon as every one of us yields up the soul, we shall be kept in rest until those times come when you will renew the creation or whether we shall be tormented at once. He answered me and said, I will show you that. I will show you that also, but do not be associated with those who have shown scorn, nor number yourself among those who are tormented. So in other words, don't put yourself in the same category. It says, for you have a treasure of works laid up with the most high, but it will not be shown to you until the last times. Now concerning death, the teaching is this, when the decisive decree has gone forth from the most high that a man shall die as the spirit leaves the body and returns again to him who gave it, First of all, it adores the glory of the Most High. I can bear witness to that. I had a dream one time. And in this dream, I saw the, the presence of the Most High just pass above me like up in a cloud. And the, the presence was so powerful. When I tell you it, it, it was so powerful that it overwhelmed me that all I could do in my dream, I just found myself just bowing down and just crying out, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And when I woke up, I was still saying, hallelujah, hallelujah. That presence was just so overwhelming. Um, so when it says that, that the spirit, it, it, it will adore the glory of the most high, I get it, I get it. And, and if it is one of those who have shown scorn and have not kept the way of the most high and who have despised his law and, ha and who have hated those who fear him, such spirits shall not enter into habitations, but shall immediately wander about in torments, ever grieving and sad in seven ways. Once again, when you go back to the story of, of the rich man and Lazarus, Lazarus went to a place of comfort the rich man went to a place of torment. So once again, you can believe it if you want to. The first way, because they have scorned the law of the Most High. The second way, because they cannot now make a good repentance that they may live. Once you close your eyes on this side of eternity and, and, and immediately you awaken on the other side, there's no more repentance. There is no repentance beyond the grave. 
And we can, we could on this side of eternity, we can cut up, we can play the fool, we can, we can play that Russian roulette and saying, well, maybe one day somewhere in the future when I'm old and gray, when I don't have all my fun, when I've done sinned all I want to and partied and smoked weed and got high and had as many women as I want to, maybe in, the, in that future, I'm going to give my heart to the Lord. But yet you may not find yourself there because death waits for no man. Um, the third way, they shall see the reward laid up for those who have trusted the covenants of the Most High. The fourth way, they shall consider the torments laid up for themselves in the last days. The fifth way, they shall see how the habitations of others are guarded by angels in profound quiet. The sixth way, they shall see how some of them will pass over into it. Let me uh, jump to the other one. Um, um, into torments. The seventh way, which is worse than all the ways that they have mentioned, that, I, that have been mentioned, because they shall utterly waste the way in confusion and be consumed with shame and shall wither with fear at seeing the glory of the Most High before whom they sinned while they were alive and before whom they are to be judged in the last times. Now, in this order, of those who have kept the ways of the Most High, when they shall have separated from their mortal body, during the time that they lived in it, they laboriously served the Most High and withstood danger every hour, and they uh, and, and that they might keep the law of the lawgiver perfectly. Therefore, this is the teaching concerning them. First of all, they shall see with great joy the glory of him who receives them. For they shall have rest in seven orders, the, the first order, because they have striven with great effort to overcome the evil thoughts which was formed in them, that they might not lead them astray from life into death. The second order, because they, they see the perplexity in which the souls of the ungodly wonder and the punishment that awaits them. The third order, they see the witnesses which, with which he who formed them bears concerning them that while they were alive, they kept the law which were given them in trust. The fourth order, they understand the rest which they now enjoy being gathered into their chambers and guarded by angels in profound quiet and the glory which awaits them in the last days. The fifth order, they rejoice that they have now escaped what is mortal and shall inherit what is to come. And besides, they see the straits and toils from which they have been delivered and the spacious liberty which they are to receive and enjoy in immortality. The sixth order, when it is shown to them, their face is to shine like the sun and how they are to be made like the light of the stars, being incorruptible from then on. The seventh order, which is greater than all that have been mentioned, because they shall rejoice with boldness and shall be confident with confu without confusion and shall be gathered without fear, for they hasten to behold the face of him who they serve in life and from whom they are to receive their reward um, when glorified. This is the order of the souls of the righteous as henceforth is announced and as afore aforesaid are the ways of torment which those who would not give heed shall suffer thereafter. I answered and said, will time therefore be given to the souls after they have separated from their bodies to see what you have described to me? He said, they shall have freedom for seven days so that during these seven days they may see the things of which you have been told and afterward they shall be gathered into their habitations, right? So these are the things that is prophesied, uh, um, at least in the, in the pseudepigrapha that would come upon um, the souls of the righteous versus the souls of the wicked. And some of the things you can see kind of ties back in together with what I, some of the other scriptures that I read in uh, the Bible. But we can believe them if we want to. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, some of those things are just the way how I see things. I'm not saying that I'm 100% right. It's uh, some of it speculation on my part, um, but that speculation is based upon scriptures and my understanding of the scriptures. Um, I'm just trying to give you an insight into what I believe happens when a soul leaves the body and the body goes back to the, to the earth. 
and that the spirit of the Most High returns to him, the spirit that gives life, but the soul of the man or the woman, the boy or the girl, um, you know, is, is, is a consciousness that remains. Um, final um, example, and it's a personal story. Um, my wife and I, uh, my wife has been pregnant four times. We have two natural born uh, uh, sons. We have uh, a daughter who we've adopted. But the other two pregnancies, one was an, a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. Um, and uh, she nearly died from that. And had it not been for my determination because the doctor wanted to send her home. Um, and I was like, no, I'm not leaving this hospital until y'all find out why my wife is having this abdominal pain. And it turned out she had a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. And for those who are in the medical field, you know that it could lead to death because of the, the, the vasculature that's around the fallopian tubes and they wanted to send her home. Uh, the second um, um, pregnancy that we, uh, we had a daughter um, that we had prayed for and um, she miscarried at six months and um, our daughter didn't make it. Um, I don't wanna think about it too much because if I do, I start to, weep again because it's been so many years and uh, the pain is still real. Um, but uh, I'm sorry, um, it's still a painful memory for us, but my wife um, had a dream one time. And in the dream, she saw our two boys, natural born boys, with a third boy walking in the middle. Um, and they were, you know, all three of them was hugging each other while they were walking along and she recognized from behind because my sons, both of them have unique ways of walking. And um, she recognized my oldest son and my youngest, but she didn't recognize the one that was in the middle. And she asked the Maliki or the angel that was with her, who, who is that person in the middle? Because I don't recognize him. And he said to her, that is your son. That is your son. And when she thought about it, she's like, but I didn't have another son. And then she remembered the ruptured ectopic pregnancy. We know the, uh, it was a girl that she miscarried at six months, but it was a, um, a, she, we never knew what the, the, the sex was of the one that she lost um, in the ruptured ectopic pregnancy. So that was the son that, that we lost. Anyway, um, I just wanted to share my thoughts with you all. Um, I pray that this has been an encouragement for some of you and maybe an eye opener for others and maybe just food for thought for some. Um, there again, I don't claim to know it all. Um, these are just my thoughts. These are just things that I believe. And like anything else, if the most high was to bring greater revelation um, to me, I'm not one who is ashamed to say, okay, this is what I thought, but now through revelation or through some other teaching, this is the conclusion that I've come to because it's a process. You know, there are things that, are, that, that, that we go through and we learn by process. There are mysteries that the Most High will reveal to us. Um, sometimes, you know, over time and sometimes we get it in little bits and little pieces, but it's all put, putting the pieces of the puzzle together. And this is the one subject that, as I said, there's such a limited knowledge of what lies beyond. And in many churches, it's not taught, it's not preached. And so, you know, many of us, we look at death or passing from this life to the next with, 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 with great uh, uh, fear and anxiety. And so the Most High is trying to let us know that, you know, as, as the Apostle Paul uh, said for me to live is, is Yesiah, Yeshua, Christ, and to die is gain. You know, I want to be one of those ones that say I fought a good fight. I kept the faith, I finished the course. Henceforth is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which Yah, the righteous judge, is gonna give us at his appearing. Anyway, I thank you all um, uh, for the, uh, once again, for the opportunity to come before you. And um, if this has been a blessing to you, um, I hope that you will like it, share it. Um, if you haven't you know, subscribed to my channel, I'm hoping you will do so as I continue to share things at the most high places on my heart. Um, you know, I'm one of those who love to teach. I love to learn. And by learning, I love to impart what I've learned to others. Um, I may not be the, the greatest teacher. Um, there's other people out there that I heard that are great teachers, have great uh, mental capacity. And, you know, but we all, you know, have gifts and we all express those gifts in our own ways. 
And so the most high may be able to use me to reach others that he may not be able to use somebody else to reach, you know, that's, that's up to him. As he said in his word, you know, um, Paul planteth, Apollos watereth, but Yah gives the increase. So I pray uh, that you all may have increase in your life. And if your life had been touched in one form or another by um, a member of your family or friends passing on, that, you know, I hope this gave, gives us a little better understanding of the things that lies beyond. And that um, hopefully as we uh, grow in the knowledge of the Most High, and as he gives us greater revelations, that these things will become clearer. So with that, I say, Matondo, thank you for listening. Uh, may the Most High Yah bless you. And I will see you all again in the next um, the next session, um, the next topic. I actually have one that's in the works already. And so maybe by next week, I'll go ahead and put that one out. All right. May the Most High Yah bless you.